slowly regaining consciousness, I found myself in a room flooded with blinding light. I felt the presence of people around me, their hands pulled and tugged at my body, but oddly enough, I did not experience physical pain, only an aggravated mental state. An obsessive question arose in my head, am I really dead? Was it the feeling of death? The tubes and wires seemed to be intertwined with every inch of my body, reminding me of the medically induced coma I had been in for three long days. Gradually, I found the strength to open my eyes, and there they were, my beloved family surrounding the bed. Helen, my wife, stood loyally to my right, and my five children formed a protective barrier around me. At that moment, my memory failed me, and I remembered almost nothing about the events that led me to the hospital bed. When I looked into the eyes of my beloved wife, she uttered words full of care and love. My dear, this time you scared us very much, but don't worry, everything will be fine now. Perplexed, I turned to Helen and asked what happened. She explained that one of the stents installed during the triple bypass surgery had failed. More precisely, it was the same graft that required the installation of a stent a month later. Unfortunately, it turned out to be too weak, as a result of which it collapsed around the stent, thereby blocking the blood flow. Fragments of my memory surfaced in the sudden rush of memories. I remember the previous year when an annual examination revealed blockages in the heart area, which forced the doctor to urgently prescribe triple bypass surgery. I had undergone open heart surgery, which is very difficult. During the operation, Blood vessels were taken from other areas of my body to replace damaged or blocked ones. Unfortunately, about a month after the operation, additional studies showed that one of the transplants did not take root as successfully as the other two. To strengthen it, a stent was installed. Up to this point, we thought everything was going well. Due to these complications, I had to take a break from work for almost six months. All this time, I diligently followed the doctor's orders, strictly adhering to a healthy diet, regularly exercising, going to the gym, and carefully monitoring what I eat. Helen, my loving wife, was by my side and supported me wholeheartedly. She joined my physical exercises and began to adhere to the same eating habits as me. As a result, in just six months, I lost an amazing 40 kilograms. At the same time, Helen managed to lose 20 kilograms and tone up her once not too strong 49-year-old figure. On our wedding day, she looked as radiant as ever, having a flawless complexion and a toned figure devoid of excess fat. Let me tell you about our journey together. I first met Helen as a student when she was a young 18-year-old freshman, and I was a 20-year-old student. We did not immediately become exclusive partners, and every week our connection became stronger. The following year, we rented an apartment and decided to live together. As I was nearing graduation, Helen moved on to her third year of college. Having convinced my parents that getting an MBA degree is extremely important for getting a promising job, they readily agreed. This choice provided Helen and me with the opportunity to live together until she receives a diploma, coinciding with the completion of my master's degree. On a wonderful June day after the graduation ceremony, Helen and I tied the knot, marking the beginning of our seemingly flawless union. Our joint actions were dictated not so much by common interests as by a sincere desire to always be close to each other. I have always believed in the power of love, and it was she who brought us together. In seven years, five beautiful children have appeared in our lives, but after the appearance of the last blessing, I decided to perform a small surgical operation to prevent the replenishment of our family in the future. Our devotion to each other and the children was unwavering, and we began to lead a truly family lifestyle. There were three girls and two boys in our family, and we tirelessly sought to maintain financial stability. We were determined not to get into debt, so we worked diligently to make ends meet. Our days were filled with constant movement, one of us constantly took the children to various events, whether it was karate, judo, ballet dancing, piano, baseball, football, or any other activity. We supported them in every possible way. Not all of our children were inclined to sports and this is quite normal. We supported their diverse interests and hobbies, giving them the opportunity to discover their individual talents. Despite the financial difficulties, I received great satisfaction and many valuable life lessons. Time flew by imperceptibly, and before we knew it, our children went to college one by one, and then their weddings followed. Helen and I took responsibility for their college loans and wedding expenses, 
wanting to give them the best possible start in life without a debt burden. Despite the fact that we were saving money for these needs, we felt financially strained, realizing that we would be in debt for another 10 years. But we did not lose optimism because Helen and I were still relatively young, and we had enough time ahead to continue working and saving for retirement. We do not regret the money invested in the education and marriage of our children, every penny was well spent, even if it meant sacrificing a luxury vacation in the Caribbean and Europe. I have never regretted the financial commitments we made to ensure a promising future for our children. After my father retired, I took responsibility for his thriving insurance business located in Plano, Texas. The company had three brokers and two office employees, so we were constantly busy. Helen, on the other hand, waited patiently for our youngest child to go to school before starting her career at a pharmaceutical company in Dallas. Helen, an extroverted sales representative, was responsible for promoting new drugs and distributing their samples to medical offices in the region. Her charming personality was perfect for this job. In addition, Helen's attractive appearance, with a height of 180 centimeters, contributed to her success. Before the start of classes with me, Helen weighed about 100 kilograms, which in my opinion quite suited her. But thanks to a purposeful diet and exercise, she managed to reach her college weight. Throughout the entire time of our relationship, our personal life has always brought satisfaction and joy. Together, we explored all possible paths and remained receptive to each other's new views. The idea of retreating from our connection never crossed our minds, and we didn't even bring up the subject. Personally, there is not a drop of jealousy in me, and in some cases, I have graciously allowed others to share the dance with Helen, but she always kept the boundaries of what was allowed, making sure that these people did not go beyond them. Although we don't really like dancing, we sometimes attend Christmas parties or other work-related events. While Helen remained unchanged in her personality, my own transformation was evident over the years, since my hair was quickly turning gray, and my weight was overweight. I have to admit that I didn't pay enough attention to my physical condition. But thanks to selfless exercise and diet, I have successfully transformed my body. But let me clarify that my appearance does not determine my value as a husband. In fact, I consider myself a hopeless romantic and an unshakable soulmate for Helen. Our bond is still strong, and we still spend romantic evenings together every Friday or Saturday to keep up the flame. I deliver fresh flowers to her office every week, which brings a touch of romance to her days. Our personal life has always been extraordinarily beautiful. Although, due to my heart problems, it is experiencing a temporary decline. Despite this, I make every effort to ensure that Helen's needs and desires are met, putting her satisfaction above all else. Helen and I have dedicated ourselves to maintaining a strong and fulfilling marriage, and I believe we have succeeded in this. In essence, our lives are filled with joy as we cherish our love for each other. But after saying goodbye to my family as a result of an unexpected turn of events, I ended up in the intensive care unit, where I stayed for several days. Medical workers expressed serious concerns about possible brain damage and insisted on constant monitoring. Although I did not understand the relationship between brain damage and the heart, my weak condition did not allow me to doubt or challenge their decision. In the late afternoon, my family returned and blessed me with their presence, spending several hours with me. At this time, Helen was looking at me, her eyes were full of care and tenderness. Looking into her eyes, I felt a deep sadness settle in her. Trying to comfort her, I assured her that I would be fine, and she had no reason for such worries. But she was silent, apparently, emotions were pressing on her. The next morning, a police officer unexpectedly came to me. Confused, I asked if I had inadvertently violated any law. In response, he looked at me and laughed. No, you haven't broken any laws, he reassured me. In fact, I was the first to react after you turned on the alarm. Your quick actions played a significant role in saving my life. I will forever remain in debt to you. I modestly waved away his gratitude, explaining my actions by simply doing my duty. It's just part of my job. I replied modestly. But deep down, I felt a sense of relief that I was nearby and arrived at the scene so quickly. Due to the limitations of my memory, could you tell me in detail about the events that took place? I can share the information that I remember, but there may be gaps that you will have to fill in. At about 2 o'clock in the morning last Friday, 
I received a signal that an alarm went off in your house. Without delay, I immediately arrived at the scene and waited for reinforcements, suspecting a possible intrusion that caused the alarm. The alarm system made several attempts to contact you, starting from a landline phone, then from a mobile phone, and finally got through to your wife's mobile phone, where only she answered. She ended up in Denver, completely unaware of the situation, but she insisted that I definitely need to be present in the house and directed us there with a sense of urgency. I began to inspect the premises, hoping to find any signs of forced entry. Despite a thorough search, there was no material evidence of a break-in. Having made up my mind, I began to look through the windows with a flashlight, desperately looking for answers. Eventually, in the back of the house, I saw a terrifying sight, you lying motionless on the kitchen floor. Reacting quickly, I had no choice but to break down the door by force to get to you. A cursory examination led me to the conclusion that you may have had a heart attack. Without hesitation, I immediately contacted the rescue service and started performing artificial respiration. A fire brigade quickly arrived at the scene, which included trained paramedics. Accordingly, I entrusted them with further treatment. After that, an ambulance arrived promptly, which urgently took you to the hospital for medical care. I immediately informed my office of the need to break into the back door to get into your house. Since your wife was in Denver and you were hospitalized, I was instructed to stay in the house until the door was properly secured to ensure safety. A carpenter was called, who fixed the plywood on the door. Also, I contacted the security company to disable the alarm system. Before I left the house, I tried to clean up the kitchen. The doctors and the ambulance crew left the area in some confusion. In the midst of this chaos, I found your mobile phone, which I am currently returning to you. But that's where my knowledge ends. Here is all the information the officer shared. Some information allowed me to fill in some gaps in the story. I remember waking up with excruciating chest pains, trying to ease the discomfort. I got up to get a glass of water and take an aspirin. Unfortunately, I only managed to reach the refrigerator and collapsed on it. There was an alarm panel next to me, and somehow I found the strength to press the alarm button. Falling to the floor, I realized that I was in mortal danger. Desperate to see my wife, I gathered strength and uttered the phrase Hey Siri, call Helen on FaceTime. A few moments later, a naked Helen materialized on the screen, worried about what was happening. Unfortunately, the beeping of the alarm clock did not allow me to hear her or answer. It was clear that she was sleeping in her usual undressed state, but I was shocked by the presence of an unfamiliar hand resting on her shoulder. Stunned, I lost consciousness and was on the verge of death if not for the unyielding determination of the deputy sheriff. Only in the afternoon, having woken up from what seemed like a coma, I finally met with a cardiologist. He started performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, ensuring your life until the arrival of firefighters. On the way to the hospital, the ambulance crew twice encountered a situation when they thought they had lost you. In one case, the car had to be stopped, and both crew members performed cardiopulmonary resuscitation before continuing to move. Even after arriving at the hospital, the situation remained critical. The graft implanted last year deteriorated, which raised concerns from the very beginning. This forced us to install a stent later, but unfortunately, it turned out to be ineffective. It is important that you understand that this is not your fault. In addition, it should be noted that you have lost weight, you did physical exercises, followed a diet, and followed my requests. I do not know if there was any damage to your brain, but at the moment, I believe there is none. Around this time, Helen arrived, greeted me warmly, and kissed me on the cheek. The memories of that night completely broke my heart. My beloved wife, with whom I have lived for three decades, betrayed me. I understood that I was not emotionally ready to confront her and sort out the situation, so I pretended that it was difficult for me to speak. But I knew that sooner or later, the conversation would take place anyway. But I wondered how I could avoid admitting that I knew about her infidelity. Was it really a romance? I had no idea. I was in the hospital for three weeks, after which I was discharged. The doctors advised me not to strain myself at home, not to lift anything heavier than five kilograms, and to refrain from sexual activity. Avoiding intimacy was not difficult because I was not sure that I would ever be able to enter into an intimate relationship with Helen again. They say that time heals all wounds, 
but in my case, it only healed my physical condition, leaving my mental anguish untouched. It felt like a hole had been ruthlessly drilled into a part of my heart. I had serious doubts that this could be fixed, and Helen, my wife, devoted her free time from work to taking care of me around the clock. Although I understood that she loved me, I doubted that I could reciprocate her feelings. We were together for a considerable time, and she felt my unhappiness and the burden of a serious problem that bothered me. After three weeks at home, we finally decided to talk. Ed, since your health deteriorated, I feel that something is bothering you a lot. Could you open up and tell me what's going on? Helen confessed. Yes, in fact, what you did may have made my situation worse, I admitted. I would like to understand the reason for your accusations. What specific topic do you have in mind? She inquired. I understand that you think I'm involved in an affair, but I think this accusation is absurd. Do I have to provide evidence that supports these words? Helen asked incredulously. I don't understand how you can lie like that. I really don't understand how you can sit here and accuse me of such things. Are you upset or excited? I questioned. Do you remember how I called you on FaceTime when I was sick? I distinctly remember there was a hand on your shoulder and someone affectionately addressed you as honey. So, I want you to tell me everything. But please start with the reason, I demanded. What are you talking about? I know you've had and probably still have an affair. This is just ridiculous. How can you blame me for this? Can I show you proof? Helen retorted. Are you that stupid? Why can't you be sincere and just tell me about it? There's no proof, and I didn't cheat. I don't understand how you can even sit here and accuse me of something like this. You must be crazy. I exclaimed. Do you remember how I FaceTimed you the night I got sick? Do you remember when a hand appeared on your shoulder and someone said honey? I witnessed everything, and it will always remain in my memory. True, I didn't hear a single word, but Helen didn't know about it. Do you need more proof? You broke our marital vows and fraudulently left for your lover. I know it was a hoax because I contacted your HR department and they confirmed that you took two days off. I cannot fully express the deep hurt and pain that you have caused me. It almost cost me my life and your actions only prevented my recovery. Now, can you understand why I've been distant and cold for the last four weeks? I want to hear the whole story, starting from the beginning. If you decide not to answer, then please pack your things and leave, I declared. It's very difficult for me. Are you absolutely sure that you want me to tell you everything? Helen hesitated. I already warned you that if you decide not to answer, then you will have to leave. I refuse to sit here and endure your lying words, I insisted. Well, I'll tell you the details, although I wish I hadn't done it. But I ask you to refrain from threats until I tell you everything. And if you insist that I leave, then I will do so, Helen conceded. Unable to tear my gaze away, I continued to stare at her anxiously, waiting for her to continue. Let's go back four months to our company's Christmas party. Remember when you warned me about that guy who was too touchy when we were dancing? I was furious and felt the urge to get into an altercation with him. But please tell me you didn't have an affair with him, Helen began. I assure you there was no romance between us. It's just that David, who as it turned out is my immediate boss, has been making unwanted attentions to me since he started working in Dallas last fall. I have always coped with his courtship without any problems. I want to clarify that I have never been and am not going to engage in extramarital affairs, she clarified. I'm a little confused. Did you recently go to Denver with him and stay in the same room for two days and nights? Can you clarify if it was just a friendly trip or if something more intimate happened between you? I probed. Ed, I have to admit that we really had an intimate contact. Unfortunately, I deeply regret every moment of that weekend. He seems to be younger and in great physical shape compared to us. Three months ago, during my annual assessment, David found out that I have been working at the same job for almost 15 years. He asked if I plan to continue working in this position until retirement. I expressed my dissatisfaction with the constant traveling in Dallas because the traffic situation seems to be getting worse. During the conversation, he asked why I did not seek a promotion. I told him that I really applied for his place, but in the end, they chose someone from the office in Atlanta. To my surprise, 
he told me that his candidacy was being considered for promotion, which would free up his current position. Expressing my interest in career growth, he asked me how much I strive to achieve this goal. Curious, I asked what he meant. Then he made an inappropriate offer, saying that he wanted to have an intimate relationship with me in exchange for the fact that he guarantees me a promotion, Helen revealed. I stood in a daze when Helen confessed that she had been blackmailed, and she willingly yielded to the demands of the blackmailer. Concerned, I pointed out the seriousness of the situation, stressing that blackmail could threaten us with serious trouble. But my wife brushed off my concerns, insisting that this is our business exclusively, not paying attention to the possible consequences. I stress that I am happily married and do not want to put my marriage in danger by engaging in illegal actions. In response, she assured me that it was just one weekend that would secure her promotion. Helen, why did you let yourself be deceived? I have been urging you to quit this job for many years. We can do without your income, especially considering that last year I was ill, and now I have taken an additional leave without pay. Although it will take us a little longer to pay off our debts, we will manage. While I admit we don't necessarily need money, it helps us keep busy, especially considering the costs of college and our kids' weddings. The additional income played a crucial role in paying off their loans. In general, I like what I do, except for traveling to work and communicating with my boss. By the way, before you finished your story, did you end up getting a promotion? Unfortunately, it looks like I didn't get a promotion, so I remain in the same position, Helen replied. I felt anger growing in me as I listened to her words. So, you're saying you spent the whole weekend cheating on me and didn't get a promotion in the end? Helen's frustration was obvious, she was shaking, and tears were streaming down her face. I would never have agreed if I had known that he would not fulfill his promise. And now, please continue your story. He continued to relentlessly pursue me at work despite my repeated refusals to communicate. I was adamant, not wanting to jeopardize my marriage. But his anger grew, and about six weeks ago, I finally gave in to his demands. We came up with a story about participating in a management conference in Denver and carefully planned the weekend. Our departure was scheduled for Thursday morning, and our return was scheduled for Saturday. He took care of everything. I remember well your initial reluctance to go, despite the fact that you constantly said that you were hoping for a promotion. It seemed strange to me because for all the time you have been working at the company, you have never gone on a business trip with an overnight stay. But I was still intrigued. You kindly drove me to the airport, where I met David in the departure lounge. Our flight was pleasant, thanks to the fact that he booked seats in business class. But what happened behind closed doors was unexpected. David booked a single room with a double bed, and his desire for me became undeniable as soon as we entered the room. On Thursday afternoon, we went sightseeing and then enjoyed a nice dinner. After a short sleep, just when he started an intimate activity, we were interrupted by an alarm signal. When I was lying down, your call had already sounded, but the sound of the alarm clock drowned out your voice. I was desperately hoping you hadn't noticed David's presence. But now I understand what you noticed, your face turned pale, and by the continuing alarm, I realized that something was wrong. Without hesitation, I hurried to the airport and caught the earliest flight home. Well, did you like this meeting? Helen explained. Yes, David made me feel young and dazzling. I strongly regret my choice to feel young again because no woman wants to feel old. I am overwhelmed with remorse and the feeling that I was taken advantage of, and I want to sincerely apologize, Ed. I am very sorry that I betrayed our sacred wedding vows and the unique ties that bound us. It pains me to admit that I resorted to lies and deceived you, which was completely out of character for me during our marriage. I am overwhelmed with a sense of humiliation, Helen, she continued. I admit that there is some truth in your words, but I noticed that after my return from the hospital, you repeatedly went to work and back. Obviously, you most likely had conversations and maybe even had an intimate relationship with David. Indeed, he insists on meeting me every time I come, even though our last intimate meeting took place back in Denver. He constantly remembers how wonderful it was and insistently demands that I reunite right now. He just wants to spend the day together here in Dallas. Despite my repeated refusals, I firmly decided never to meet him again. I assure you there is absolutely no chance of that. But how can I trust you? I clearly remember how in January last year, 
you changed your hair color and started updating your wardrobe with more provocative outfits. It seems obvious that your affair began shortly after the Christmas party. I think that I was not mistaken in my assumption. Since she did not answer, her silence confirmed my suspicions. It seems that this romance has been going on and is most likely going on. If you had come to me when everything was just beginning, we could have prevented everything that happened. I don't want you to go to work until we find a way out of this situation. I may need work-related information. By the way, can you access your company's website from home? I inquired. Yes, I can log in remotely. Ed, do you want me to leave? Is that what you want? Do you want to be with David? Helen questioned. I have already expressed my position on this issue. I don't want to be with him. My desire is to be with you and work on our marriage, if that's what you want. I'm ready to quit my job starting tomorrow. Please tell me what you want, I replied. Helen, I deeply sympathize with your situation. It seems like he was manipulating you, and I doubt he even wanted to help you get promoted. I hope he hasn't passed on any sexually transmitted diseases to you. I expressed my concern. Helen gasped, her eyes filled with tears again. The realization hit her, and she promised herself to see a doctor immediately. After the heart attack, we did not have intimacy, so there is no risk of transferring anything to me. Have you had an intimate relationship with anyone else during this time, Ed? It looks like you think I'm, but no, I haven't been with anyone, and I'm not going to. How can you even assume that? Yes, I was attracted to him but that doesn't mean I acted on it. How can I trust your words? You know, as they say, after tasting something, it's hard to resist. But I assure you, I didn't give up, Helen explained. Let's not dwell on this. David was younger, but that doesn't mean I love him. Do I want to continue dating him? Absolutely not. I sincerely hope that I will never meet him again, she added. Helen, it's very important that he feels the pain he caused us. Yes, I mention us because I feel your own pain, and yes, it hurts me too. I feel great shame for my actions. It hurts you too, because you were caught, or because of the betrayal itself? I asked, seeking clarification. I apologize for the pain we both feel. I believe that if you had never found out about the betrayal, our marriage could have remained flawless as before. But, Helen... I now realized that my point of view was wrong. Perhaps it would be better if you packed a suitcase and stayed with one of our children for a few days. I need time to reflect, and it would be helpful if you also considered your actions. It is very important to remember that every action has its consequences. In addition, it is advisable to distance yourself from work, in particular from this person, I suggested. After Helen left, I turned to our reliable family lawyer, Ted Brown, for help. I explained the whole situation to him, and he quickly recognized several criminal acts involved. Helen found herself in an unpleasant situation when her boss, David, resorted to coercive tactics to force her into an intimate relationship in exchange for a promotion. Ted insisted on collecting evidence to expose and bring them to justice. However, I needed time to study the question further before making any decisions. Given my dependence on numerous new medications, I went to bed early desperate to rest after an extremely stressful day. But sleep did not come, and I found myself thinking about my wife's fate, realizing that ultimately, everything depends on her, not on me. Doubts overwhelmed me, I was certain she had hidden the truth about her infidelity from me. The next morning, my daughter called, upset and asking what I had done with her mother. Hey, honey, I swear I didn't do anything to her. What did she tell you? Nothing special. She cried all night and was very upset. Do you know where she is? Mom said she left for work, even though I specifically asked her not to. Okay, let me know when she gets back. She said she was spending the night with a friend, so she took her suitcase. I have to go, we'll talk later. Goodbye, Dad. Bye, baby. Feeling the need to act, I decided to call Helen. Helen, how, how are you doing today? Well, not really. I just left Karen. I called my daughter and found out that you were going to work, but I have not decided on my place of residence. The thought of spending another night with Karen was unbearable, and I decided to go home. Doubtfully, I asked if she was sure of this, to which she replied in the affirmative, 
promising to make coffee. With that, she abruptly interrupted the conversation. My fear increased, I was afraid that she had reunited with her lover. In a panic, I immediately contacted my friend under the nickname Pi. Hi, this is Ed, I said. Do you have any news for me? Pi informed me that they had been following my wife's movements and initially believed she was heading towards David Jenkins' apartment. But then they noticed a change in direction. We have collected a significant amount of information about David Jenkins and are currently studying it to separate reliable details from unreliable ones. Today, we will present you with a full report. Also, do you want us to continue monitoring your wife's activities? If so, we can do it within the next four or five days. While I was sitting in the kitchen, Helen came in, and I offered her a cup of coffee. She sincerely apologized for what she had said the day before, expressing concern about how it could negatively affect our marriage if the betrayal was revealed. She explained that it was not her intention to continue the relationship with David. After taking a sip of coffee, she continued talking. I deeply apologize for my infidelity and for breaking our marriage vows. Our relationship was wonderful, and I sincerely hope that you will find the strength in your heart to forgive me. May I ask where you were going this morning? I was going to meet David and talk to him. I need to deal with his constant harassment. Besides, if it's any consolation, I wouldn't have an intimate relationship with him. You're probably wondering how I found out where he lives. Well, one day he asked for a ride home. But please believe me that I never went into his apartment. I want to assure you that I have never had an intimate relationship with him at his home. You never gave me a reason to be jealous, but when I found out that basis was with you, I felt insecure. Helen came over to me, sat on my lap, and hugged me tightly. She whispered, I need you to hug me. After a light lunch, we both went back to bed, tired from a restless night, and spent the afternoon falling asleep in each other's arms. I still didn't know which direction to go next, and Helen didn't make my decision any easier. Later in the evening, while we were watching TV, I turned off the sound and turned to her. During the conversation, I explained to her my intention to file a lawsuit against her company and David Jenkins. To my surprise, she seemed taken aback and tried to dissuade me from the trial. Helen, I don't understand why you're opposing this and not supporting me. You've already said that you plan to quit your job and stop your involvement in Jenkins' affairs. Your reaction is not what I expected from you. All I want is for this situation to be resolved without harming anyone else or my company. You understand what extortion is and it's pretty obvious that David used coercion to manipulate you. Do you really want to let him leave without consequences, giving him the opportunity to repeat his actions? Do you really think that I will sit idly by? Bass has tried to ruin our marriage, and now I'm going to completely ruin his life. I very much doubt that he will dare to repeat his actions. I turned off the TV and calmly said, Wait, I'll be right back. Heading to my computer, I quickly printed out the documents sent by my trusted source. Helen, I have to show you something. An email came to me. I carefully scrolled through each page until I found what I wanted. Look, Ba was forced to leave Atlanta because of an unresolved sexual harassment lawsuit that brought shame on the company, even though it wasn't proven. Moreover, during his student years, he was accused of committing a crime against sexual integrity, but no evidence was found to support these accusations. I'm wondering why you're standing up for him. It seems that you have feelings for him and want to preserve your intimate relationship. She abruptly rose from her seat, directing her anger at me, and exclaimed, Do whatever you think is necessary. With that, she ran off to the guest bedroom. It was obvious that she was furious and upset with my intention to go to court. I couldn't help but wonder why she was so insistent on supporting him. Maybe she had romantic feelings for him. Once again, I barely managed to find a quiet night's rest. Every time I believed that we were telling the truth and that we had a chance to fix our relationship, Helen stubbornly hindered my progress. The next morning, I was standing in the kitchen when she came in. Good morning. Would you like some breakfast? I suggested. No, thank you. I'll be out for a couple of hours. I'll be back before noon, she replied without any affectionate gestures or declarations of love. I couldn't shake the certainty that she was communicating with her lover and most likely exchanging text messages with him throughout the evening. The emotional distance between us was increasing, and deep down, 
I felt that the hope of reconciliation was fading. Helen was gone for two hours, and just before she came back, I got a call. Ed, is your wife at a Starbucks on 3rd Street by Jenkins? They chatted over a cup of coffee for more than an hour, after which they said goodbye, and she even kissed him goodbye. These simple details were enough for me to make a decision. Around noon, Helen finally returned and found me in the kitchen, where she was treated to a cup of coffee. I couldn't resist asking her a question. Helen, didn't you have enough coffee at Starbucks? Did you really ask someone to follow me? No, my dear. One of my clients works there and witnessed how you met with Jenkins. Apparently, it was very good for you. Yes, I met him, as I said yesterday. I was looking for an opportunity to end the relationship. But I have to ask, is it customary for you to kiss someone when you want to end it? Helen, please pack your things and leave, as I am tired of your lies and deception. You can go to Jenkins, I don't care, because our relationship has come to an end. I know you're still finding ways to see him and continue your romance. How can you admit to your long-term spouse that their marriage has turned into a facade and is now over? How can you let go of so many years of loving partnership? While she packed up and left the house, I stayed in the kitchen. After that, a private detective called me and confirmed that Helen was in her lover's apartment. Thanking him for the information provided, I asked him to send me an invoice, since his services are no longer needed. The next day turned out to be incredibly hectic. I contacted my lawyer and informed him of my desire for Helen to be taken to court immediately, preferably at the place of residence of her lover. At the same time, I took the necessary steps to separate our bank accounts and cancel all joint credit cards in order to exclude her name from common ownership. At the same time, I decided to leave her mobile phone on my account, intending to keep her in touch for now. After thinking about it for a while, I decided to contact my lawyer friend, Ted. On the same day, I gave him clear instructions to file lawsuits against the pharmaceutical company and David Jenkins. At the same time, I wanted to hold the company accountable for allowing the management to use blackmail to force a subordinate employee into an unpleasant sexual situation, which eventually led to the dissolution of the marriage. As for Jenkins, he should have been prosecuted both for extortion from a subordinate employee and for his intimate harassment. Although I wanted to bring a case against him for ruining my own marriage, I recognized that Helen was no less responsible. Realizing that there was no evidence in the case, I understood that its continuation would unwittingly attract unwanted attention both to him and to the company with which he is associated. Fortunately, Ted diligently carried out the necessary preparations and prepared all the necessary documents. Before taking legal action against Jenkins or the pharmaceutical company, we needed to file an administrative application with the Federal Equal Opportunity Commission, commonly referred to as the EEOC. This step was just a procedural requirement, but it is the initial step in solving any situation related to harassment. After Jenkins filed the application, Helen got in touch on the same day, showing immediate hostility. Ed, what made you do this? David's job is now under threat and all chances of career advancement have been taken away from him. Helen, why do you even care what happens to him? You assured me that you left him. By the way, where do you live now? Karen mentioned that you weren't with her. Did you move in with Jenkins? I don't want to witness how he suffered, especially if it would damage his professional life. As for me, I live with a friend. For your information, I plan to completely destroy his career, just as he destroyed our marriage. So, is your friend a man or a woman? It's amazing to hear such words from you. It's not like you at all. I've never seen my marriage break down like this before, and I think you played a significant role in this. Disappointed, I stopped talking. The next day, an off-duty sheriff's deputy found Helen in Jenkins' apartment and handed her the divorce papers. In the evening, she called again, this time in tears. Ed, how could you force me to file for divorce? I believed our marriage meant more to you than that, and I hoped we could save it. Our marriage was strong until she let that other man seduce you. For the past few months, I felt insignificant in her life. I had a feeling that something was wrong when you changed your hair color, but I trusted you so much that I didn't pry. It's anyone's guess how long Jenkins will keep you around, especially now that I know you've moved in with him. Have you forgotten that he is 15 years younger than you? 
You're just a temporary toy, and as soon as he gets tired of you, I'm sure he'll unceremoniously end it and leave. As for our financial issues, I confirm that we will share everything equally, including the debts of our children. Today, I took the liberty to check the balance of the debt. The total amount of expenses is a little less than $400,000. That is, each of us has to pay about $200,000. I do not know how you are going to financially support your partner when he loses his job and at the same time pay off the loan, but this is solely your concern. You need to go to a lawyer. And I have to warn you that if you challenge the divorce, I will turn into an opponent that you will not recognize. I have videos that I can distribute to our friends. The next day, I officially resigned from my position in the insurance company. I deliberately chose unemployment to avoid any complications during the divorce process. Since it was a family business, I had the opportunity to go back there whenever I wanted, but due to illness, my working day in the last year was extremely limited, and the doctor advised me not to strain myself for the next six months. Helen's actions seemed incomprehensible to me. She expressed a desire to continue our marriage but at the same time wanted to maintain a relationship with her lover. Ted called and informed me that the pharmaceutical company had finally responded to our lawsuit. They were caught off guard and suspended Jenkins from work while an internal investigation was conducted. Ted asked how many sexual harassment cases were necessary for his dismissal since, in his opinion, the Dallas office did not pay attention to the problems that led to his departure from the Atlanta office. Our efforts undoubtedly attracted their attention, and they expressed their willingness to settle the issues out of court. Concerned about preserving my privacy, I suggested that Ted postpone the discussion of the settlement agreement until the end of the divorce process, since I was not going to share the details with Helen. Helen tried to contact me by phone, but I chose to reject her calls, which apparently angered her as she persistently tried to call me several times during the day. I continued to reject her phone calls, realizing that she was beginning to experience pain and that it would only get worse. The next day, Helen came to the house looking for a conversation. Ed, I need to talk to you, but you're not answering my calls, she begged. Please don't do that, I sighed and replied, Helen, I don't think I've made myself clear enough, and to be honest, I'm tired of repeating myself. I will not tolerate being made a fool of. You cheated on me more than once, and not just for the weekend. For many months, you have been trying to fraudulently get out of a situation that has caused me immeasurable pain. Unfortunately, due to health reasons, I am currently unable to cope with all this load. Apparently, you have neglected honesty and the priority of our well-being is promised in our wedding vows. In this regard, I have decided to cut you out of my life. Since Christmas, you've been constantly lying to me and entering into a secret relationship with your boss. It is likely that your actions will lead to his, and possibly to your, dismissal from the company. Unfortunately, you completely ruined my life. I'm willing to do anything to ruin both yours and Jenkins' lives. David was fired from his job this morning, and I'm in limbo right now. Knowing that he has no savings and is deeply upset brings me only joy. I believe that soon you will both be forcibly evicted from his luxurious apartment. Don't forget about the $200,000 debt hanging over your heads, along with the car loan and insurance payments. By the way, you are more than 10 days late in paying the insurance premium for the car, and according to the terms of the policy, it will be terminated today. It would be wise if you turn to another insurance broker. In the past, you have performed all the necessary procedures, so I ask you to stop servicing my policy. It seems like you're very stupid, isn't it? Our connection and my presence in your life have ceased to exist. From now on, I will no longer act in your favor. There is a new person in your life who will fulfill this role, although it seems that he can only be a good follower. Your own actions have led to such circumstances, so if you are looking for someone to blame, then look no further than yourself. Now, if you don't want to discuss something specific, I have to ask you to leave. I had no desire to move, but circumstances forced us to divide the property. Unfortunately, I was unable to purchase the part of the house that belongs to Helen and decided to put it up for sale. To my surprise, it was quickly bought, and since we had no debts on this house, the money from the sale made it possible to significantly ease my share of the debt. Fortunately, I managed to find an inexpensive apartment. Collecting things from home, I took only what I wanted without consulting Helen, since she was to blame for the whole situation. After the full move, 
I contacted Helen and stressed that she urgently needed to pick up her things from home, otherwise, I would transfer everything to Goodwill. I explained that I had already vacated the premises as it had been sold to a new buyer. I gave her two weeks to choose the things she would like to keep, but despite all my efforts, Helen called me again and in a telephone conversation vented her anger, accusing me of taking all valuables from home. She expressed disappointment that I took away a few things she needed. I firmly reminded her that my actions were truly generous given the circumstances. Her decision to leave home and enter into a relationship with her lover eventually led to the fact that she lost all rights to the property acquired during our marriage. You made a decision about what is most important to you, and unfortunately, it did not concern me or the property in our house. A few weeks passed, and we didn't communicate anymore. Finally, the sale of the house was completed, and we divided the proceeds among ourselves. I used my part to pay off my share of the loan, and it was very nice for me to get rid of this debt because I despise anyone's debts. Ted, my lawyer, suddenly called and informed me that my wife was challenging the terms of the divorce regarding the distribution of our property. We've shared everything equally before, so I didn't try to hide anything, but it made me think about what kind of property can actually be challenged. The presiding judge turned out to be an elderly man, apparently well acquainted with the countless divorce proceedings he had encountered. Interested, he turned to Helen's lawyer, demanding clarification on this issue, since all the property seemed to have been divided. But after a few moments, the truth became obvious. Helen wanted to claim 50% of the shares of the insurance business. After entering into a brief exchange of views with my lawyer, we quickly approached the judge to state our position. With the deepest respect, we appealed to the court, emphasizing the fact that my wife did not have ownership rights to this insurance business. On the contrary, it rightfully belonged to my father, and I was just an employee. Moreover, due to serious health problems, unfortunately, I was forced to resign, as a result of which I no longer have any relation to the company. In the courtroom, my elderly father, who was over 80 years old, confidently rose from his seat and politely asked for permission to speak, which the judge graciously granted. As Ed's father, I confirm that the statement about them is true. The fact is that I am still the owner of the insurance business, and it will bear my name until my death, after which my son will rightfully inherit it. At that moment, my gaze shifted to Helen, and her expression expressed a deep sense of shame. She had a quiet conversation with her lawyer, who immediately got up and said that there would be no more objections to the divorce. After the judge acknowledged this, the finality of our separation was officially announced. Despite the fact that I was freed from the legal ties that bound us, I was overcome with sadness because once Helen and I were connected by a full life. Our marriage was fine until her lover appeared in it. He became a catalyst for destruction, tearing apart our once happy home. During the proceedings, my son joined me and asked me to take a short break for the toilet. It was at this moment that Helen plucked up the courage and approached me. She said, Ed, I'm really sorry that our marriage has come to this state. I apologize for the lies and infidelity. It pains me to admit that everything you predicted has become reality. David left me for a younger woman, his life collapsed after he was fired, and he used a significant portion of the money from the sale of the house, leaving me burdened with debts and stuck in a low-paid job. I hope that this outcome will bring you satisfaction, but it's important to admit that it's your own fault that all this happened. All my actions were a direct response to your actions. Can we maintain friendly relations? I replied, Helen, I'm not sure. Maybe in the future, but at the moment, I don't believe it's possible. You have caused me so much pain, and every time I see you, I feel only heartache and suffering. Maybe in time, I'll be able to forget about it, but not yet. This is my current mood. We had a strong bond that lasted for many years, but I made a difficult decision to leave and start a new path. Eventually, the pharmaceutical company reached an out-of-court settlement, as a result of which my fortune significantly increased by half a million. Perhaps I could have obtained further compensation, but at that time, my main goal was to end the past. The monetary aspect was insignificant compared to the search for justice. Unfortunately, Helen was never able to find a job that would match the previous profitable one and remained burdened with debts. Her life turned into a constant series of problems and difficulties despite the constant support and help of my children. Forgiving her turned out to be a difficult task. According to them, she rarely went on dates and looked older than her years. Although I sympathize with her, 
she had brought this fate upon herself, and it was time for her to take responsibility for her actions. Jenkins faced numerous difficulties in his life, especially when it came to finding a job. Every time he applied for a job, his past mistakes that haunted him surfaced. Having no money, Jenkins decided to take a radical step to declare bankruptcy in order to avoid a difficult trial with me. As a result, his car was confiscated, and he was forced to settle for a job at Lowe's, living in a cramped apartment. The lavish lifestyle he used to lead has disappeared indefinitely. As for me, it took me another four months to successfully complete rehabilitation, after which I gradually returned to the insurance industry, first working part-time and then switching to full-time. In an effort to ease the burden of taxes, my father began to transfer 10% of shares to me annually. Although I went on dates periodically, I never managed to meet the perfect woman because I inexplicably measured each of them with the memories of Helen, my former partner. But then, at Christmas in the house of one of my children, I saw her, a beautiful woman whom I instantly fell in love with, and now we are happily married. Story 2 David Jenkins had been suffering and feeling distrustful for several hours. A mysterious email has destroyed his world informing him that his beloved wife Lauren was spotted last week in a motel room and is currently having dinner with the same man. David's shock is indescribable, their love was deep, and this revelation left him completely confused. Their feelings for each other seemed unshakable. He recently turned 30 years old. He couldn't help but pay attention to this letter and its hidden meanings. Therefore, when he returned home that day, a feeling of anxiety and anxiety gripped him like never before. Arriving at the house around 6 p.m., he noticed Lauren's parked car, which indicated her arrival. He saw that she was standing at the sink in a work suit, busy washing vegetables. When he entered the kitchen, he was greeted with a hesitant greeting. He put his briefcase on the floor. Hello, dear. How was your day? Lauren quickly wiped her hands with a towel and turned around and kissed him on the cheek. David couldn't help but be amazed at how carefree she looked despite having spent the whole day with another man. Everything was great but there is bad news about the project we are working on. It looks like I'm going to have to go to Greensboro on Friday, so I won't be back until 8 o'clock at night, depending on how the meetings go. And then I'll go home, Lauren explained. David was familiar with Lauren's work schedule and knew that she could be as free as possible on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. In order to verify the accusations contained in the email, his idea was to make it easier for Lauren on the upcoming Friday. Statements that he had problems with the project, a meeting, and a business trip were fiction. Instead, he decided to take the day off on Friday himself and use that time to do some necessary work, as well as follow up on the motel where Lauren and her lover were staying. Hey, at least you don't have to stay overnight. We can still spend the weekend together, Lauren offered, her tone sounding very convincing. David thought for a moment, realizing how caring Lauren was despite his unexpected business trip. You know what, since I don't know when you're coming back, could you call me when you leave Greensboro? I'll try to cook dinner, she offered. Yesterday, he would not have paid attention to such a caring gesture of Lauren. Now he doubted that she had asked him to give her a two-hour period of time to hide any evidence of her infidelity. Of course, I will call you as soon as I have a clear understanding of when I can leave Greensboro, and at the same time, I will tell you the estimated time of my return on the road, David assured her. Okay, she replied. The purpose of Friday now was to make it easier for Lauren to cheat with her lover again, assuming that it really was her at the motel. And if this letter turns out to be true, David wanted Lauren to think she didn't have to worry about him catching her. David, I'm going to cook dinner and then take a quick shower. Can you keep an eye on the frying pan? She asked as she picked up her purse and headed upstairs. Don't worry, honey. I'll look after her, David replied although it seemed strange to him. She usually leaves her purse downstairs. He thought to himself, wondering why she went to the shower right now, since this was not a common practice for her. She usually did not take a shower immediately after arriving home. Therefore, when he was sorting out the mail and cooking vegetables, he was seized with a feeling of anxiety. Was this unexpected trip to the shower somehow connected with the contents of the letter he had received earlier? David sighed thinking to himself, my life is a mess. Just one anonymous letter, and now I'm already questioning all the moments of my once happy marriage. Throughout dinner, it was noticeable that David was in thought. 
Is there something else bothering you, dear? You look unusually quiet and detached. Do you have any problems apart from the project we discussed? Lauren asked, noticing David's brief and abrupt answers to her previous questions. No, I guess I'm just tired and very immersed in preparing for our trip to Greensboro on Friday, David replied, realizing that he needed to maintain the appearance of normal behavior so as not to arouse Lauren's suspicions. David felt it was a bit funny what is considered normal these days. Maybe my wife is having an affair, or I will become the object of someone's stupid jokes, or in the worst case, I will inadvertently become the victim of an error in the email address. What if the sender confused a completely different woman with my wife? Such a life becomes unbearable. Yesterday I was satisfied and confident in my happiness, and today I am in complete uncertainty. After cleaning himself up after dinner, he sat down to watch TV, trying to distract himself. David and Lauren discussed their weekend plans before getting ready for bed. David noted that he needed to get some sleep as he had to get up early for work to prepare for the upcoming trip. The thought of what might happen if Lauren started getting intimate tonight made David's stomach ache. Trying to make sense of all this, he felt completely lost, as if he was trying to grab the tail of a lying donkey in the dark. Lauren got into bed before David eagerly wrapping her arms around him. In a playful tone, she suggested, Can I take you away from work for at least half an hour, my love? David's thoughts raced faster as he realized that more and more pressure was being put on him. Oh no, he mused softly, how much more can I take before I lose control of myself? Staying true to his original plan, he patiently replied, as much as I would like to, my dear, I'm afraid that neither today nor tomorrow I will be able to be of use to you. This project has completely absorbed me. Saying these words, he once again could not comprehend how much his life had changed in the minute it took him to read and understand that simple letter that he received just ten hours ago. It's all right, my love. I understand everything. I just thought that if you don't mind, I could give you a much-needed rest. Lauren hugged David tightly, kissed him gently on the back of the head, wished him good night, and turned away. David felt a sense of relief mixed with confusion. When she said the words, despair overwhelmed him as he thought, it's just my damn luck. Trying to avoid further questioning and judgmental looks, David got out of bed and left for work before Lauren woke up. It dawned on David that he had misjudged the situation. The events of the past evening were reminiscent of the insidiousness of Edgar Allan Poe's infamous story The Telltale Heart. Realizing this, he decided to avoid another evening of intimacy with Lauren. Hi baby, I just wanted to let you know that I will be working late today to prepare for the upcoming trip and tomorrow's meetings. You don't have to worry about dinner for me, I'll grab something myself. I'll try to catch you before going to bed, this text from David sounded in her voicemail, left around noon. However, Thursday turned out to be far from productive in terms of preparing for business meetings. Being a born and professional planner and organizer, David could not get rid of the need to put things in order. Although he had no concrete proof of her infidelity, he felt obliged to put everything in order. He relentlessly contacted numerous lawyers until he finally found one to meet with the next day, and at the same time combed the internet for possible recording devices. Having made the decision to purchase, he began to look for the nearest stores in the city offering similar devices. Eventually, he came across a store that caught his attention and mentally noted that he would definitely visit it before going home. Despite David's indisputable competence in his current job, his thoughts and emotions were clearly elsewhere. Arriving from work a little late, he headed to a store specializing in listening equipment. There, he acquired a voice control pen that could be discreetly put in Lauren's purse, an item that she usually carried with her in the office and in the car. Lauren was delighted to meet David when he arrived home around 9 o'clock in the evening, glad that he had finally returned. Hello dear, how is the work on the project and the upcoming trip going? She asked David, trying to create the appearance of preparing for the upcoming trip. What is it? She asked, noticing David's brief and abrupt answers to her previous questions. David, I think everything is going well. We have allocated additional resources to address these new challenges, so I hope that by Friday, everything will be resolved for better or worse. David pondered, realizing all the risks associated with this, no matter whether they are beneficial or harmful. Did she share the same feelings now? Fortunately, Thursday evening went according to the same plan as the previous one. Lauren, to her credit, looked completely unperturbed, 
and in David's opinion, behaved with him the same way as before. However, in comparison with him, David was in complete disarray. On Friday, David got up early again at dawn. He meticulously examined the pen, made sure that it was in perfect working condition, and carefully put it in Lauren's purse. Having completed this task, he left the house. To pass the time, he decided to stop by a local coffee shop. In the end, the clock struck 10 a.m., which means it was time for his appointment with the lawyer. Initially, David planned to meet solely to gather information. However, during the meeting, he realized that he unexpectedly liked the lawyer's demeanor and experience, and he really appreciated him. During the conversation, they delved into the essence of this damn email and its lingering but unclear worries. In addition, they noted that an important meeting of his wife with her lover would take place today, and David intended to personally verify this. Realizing that he had only this disappointing letter as proof, the idea of investing money in a private detective or expensive equipment for electronic surveillance seemed impractical. David's meeting with a lawyer allowed him to understand the predictability of the divorce process. In the absence of children, divorce without the fault of the spouses turned out to be relatively simple, especially considering the comparable incomes and retirement savings of David and Lauren. Although there was a significant amount of debt on their house, the thought of liquidating it would be more of a psychological shock than a financial burden. Nevertheless, leaving the law office, David felt completely confused. How can I survive this terrible situation and convince myself that everything will not be so terrible? We were destined to be united forever until death separated us. During lunch, David was sitting at Starbucks, enthusiastically browsing the internet and delving into the topic of divorce. The sites were replete with information on how to recognize the signs of infidelity, how to evade responsibility, hide income, and even detect them. The most informative were the sources devoted only to finding out the causes of adultery. Lauren's motivation caused a great resonance with David. Perhaps it was this realization that caused David to secretly wish that all this turned out to be a delusion. He couldn't imagine Lauren cheating on him. Their bond was too strong, their love too deep, their bond too harmonious for the betrayal to be real. Having reached the point where it became unbearable to read about cheating, David packed up his things and headed to the same motel. Time seemed to fly by imperceptibly, or so it seemed to David, as he was on his way to the motel mentioned in that disappointing letter. An understanding came over him, if the affair he suspected was really true, then it's likely that Lauren didn't always choose the same motel. This possibility made all his efforts meaningless and deprived him of confidence that he would be able to discover something. A pen discreetly placed in her purse could eventually give answers to some questions, but David could no longer tolerate the uncertainty of the future of his marriage. Arriving at the motel parking lot at 1.40 p.m., he parked his car in a secluded spot that overlooked most of the rooms. Now all that remained was to wait patiently. Since there weren't many people moving in and out of the motel, the man's actions caught David's attention. After parking his smart Acura, the man headed to the office and then entered the room on the first floor. Although David couldn't remember the man's name, he thought he recognized him. It began to seem to him that he had already met this person in the past. All of David's doubts and hopes were dashed in an instant. Just five minutes after Lauren's Honda Accord stopped next to the Acura, she got out of the car clutching her purse tightly in her hands. She quickly went to the door of the same room and without hesitation knocked on it. After a few moments, the man opened the door, allowing Lauren to slip inside without difficulty, radiating his trademark confidence. The realization of this fact hit David like a ton of bricks and plunged him into despair. To hell with my life, he muttered bitterly, slamming his fists on the steering wheel in frustration. How could Lauren betray us like that, and why? It was complete chaos with no logical explanation. David felt completely lost and insecure. The man he thought was reliable and consistent had completely betrayed him. David's thoughts whirled in a whirlwind, rushing in all directions like a dizzying roller coaster fury in carowinds. At that moment, he painfully realized that his marriage was collapsing. Realizing that it wasn't the first time Lauren was cheating, David felt a deep sense of hopelessness. He seemed to have nothing more to lose. Near the motel, he had no desire to confront them by knocking on the door. The situation could turn into trouble, and he needed time and personal space to put himself in order and develop a strategy for further actions. 
his previous self-doubt did not allow him to emotionally prepare for the upcoming actions. Suddenly, he remembered the pen he had slipped into her purse and grimaced bitterly. This realization hit him hard, and he thought, that's right, that damn pen. How wonderful, he managed to take several pictures of two cars standing side by side and save the history of their meeting. He was especially interested in the man's car. He zoomed in and photographed its license plate. Gradually, he turned to the exit and drove out onto the road again. Having no purpose as a result of aimless driving, he found himself dangerously close to a red traffic light, narrowly avoiding a collision that plunged him into shock. He was looking for something that could calm him down and went to a local pub where, over a glass of refreshing beer, he was able to take a break and think about all his thoughts. At first, it seemed to him that he had moved from a simple premonition to a complete understanding, but he soon realized how little he knew about the current situation. The identity of this man remained a mystery, as well as the duration and motives of his wife's infidelity. In his opinion, he and Lauren were in an exclusive relationship for more than seven years, which ended in an engagement and subsequent marriage. Despite the fact that he had proof, he had no confidence that Lauren would tell him the whole truth. Despite the fact that listening to the recording would not make him feel the best, he had to listen to this recording before he told Lauren that he knew about her affair. He understood that being around Lauren when she was in the mood for intimacy later after his proposed business trip would be problematic. All week, he tried to distance himself from her using a business trip as an excuse. However, now that the trip was no longer a valid reason, refusing to be intimate with Lauren would only attract attention. This made him think about what was best to do. I need this pen urgently. After that, I'm going to leave this place and spend a few days thinking about my current situation, David mentally noted. After the rough plan was drawn up, an insidious idea came to David's head. She expected me to arrive later than usual tonight. In order not to upset either her or her lover, I have to call and tell her that I'm almost home. After finishing his drink and paying the bill, he pulled the car onto the road and reached for the phone, dialing Lauren's number. After typing a voice message, he spoke excitedly, Hi honey, I have amazing news. Our hard work has borne enormous fruit, and everyone has done a great job to put everything back in its place. I am only 30 minutes away from home, and there are almost no traffic jams on the road. I have to be home at the usual time. When these words fell from his lips, David couldn't help but be disappointed. I hope this will finish her to the depths of her soul, you insidious woman, he continued on his way to the house, where he quickly collected several bags and put them in the trunk of his car. Calming down, he set about writing a letter for Lauren. Given the uncertainty of the outcome of the evening, he wanted to leave unnoticed, without unnecessary conflicts. Since the contents of the recording on the spy pen were unknown to him, he preferred to postpone a serious confrontation for now. Besides, he wanted to leave her in the same condition she left him in. While dialing Lauren's number, David did not yet know that she and her lover Rob were entering into the last intimate relationship of the day, which meant the end of their romance together. After listening to the voicemail message, she quietly exclaimed, Oh no, I have to say, Rob, it was David who informed her that he was already on his way home and would arrive around 6 o'clock in the evening. Well, at least you're lucky they warned you about the call in advance, Rob playfully remarked, and Lauren hugged him and said goodbye, then hurried to the bathroom to take a shower. Rob dressed quickly and left the room, leaving Lauren to enjoy a refreshing shower. His goal was the gym, where he always went after intimacy. Meanwhile, as she drove home, Lauren couldn't shake the thought of David's unexpected early arrival and his joyful mood. Driving into their neighborhood, she assumed that he would arrive home late and tired, considering he hadn't been home for most of the week. She thought he'd probably want intimacy tonight. Approaching the house with slight anxiety, she turned the corner and saw that David's car was already parked at the entrance. She was surprised how he managed to drive so quickly through these Friday traffic jams and muttered, Wow, he's good. After parking her Accord next to her husband's car, Lauren couldn't help but think that her husband would happily hug her as soon as she walked inside. She was thinking that offering a nice holiday dinner in advance might be a wise decision. David waited anxiously for Lauren's car to pull up to the house. This would be their first meeting since he found out about her infidelity. There were already collected things in the car, the note was carefully prepared, only a pen was missing to find out all the details. Having settled down in the living room, 
he expected to intercept Lauren immediately upon her arrival. Hi honey, Lauren exclaimed, entering the room and noticing David getting up from his seat. He exuded a sense of self-confidence. It looks like everything went smoothly. How about we treat ourselves to a celebratory dinner, she offered, hugging him and kissing him gently. Sounds great, David replied, his face beaming with happiness. Since I got home earlier than expected, why don't you go upstairs and change while I book a table, he suggested. Lauren readily nodded in agreement, carefully put her work bag and purse on the table, and headed up the stairs to the bedroom. As soon as David heard the sound of the shower turning on, he quietly made his way to her purse and took out a pen. Carefully pressing the rewind button, he turned on playback and listened to the intimate conversation of the lovers, and then quickly turned off the knob. With a heavy heart, David admitted that it was time to put everything behind him. He carefully placed the note for Lauren on the table next to her things and stood for a moment in the doorway. A feeling of sadness gripped him when he looked back at their shared home, realizing that it was no longer possible to return the love that bound him and Lauren. In a hurry, Lauren headed to the shower, thinking that her husband might be hungry after traveling and would want intimacy later. However, not finding him in the living room, she quickly headed to the kitchen. After looking around, she came across a note lying on the table. Grabbing it, she anxiously began to read, and then she was overcome by shock and despair. No, God, no, it can't be true, she gasped. I found out about your love and the affair that you started. I must admit that at first, it was hard for me to believe it, but your date at the motel dispelled all my doubts. This revelation has completely torn my soul apart, and I feel deep sadness and anger towards you. I can't be around you right now. I want to collect my thoughts and decided to leave for a night or two. As soon as I sort out my emotions, I will contact you to arrange a time for our conversation. I ask you to refrain from trying to contact me or find me during this period. It's better for both of us if I'm not around until I'm ready to meet you face to face. After settling in the room, he had dinner downstairs and reluctantly ordered a double scotch with ice. When he returned to the room, he felt that he had to listen to the recording. Settling into the room, he had dinner downstairs and reluctantly ordered a double scotch with ice. When he returned to the room, he felt that he had to listen to the recording. Settling into a chair next to his desk, he turned on the recorder, and the moment Lauren entered the room, a familiar sound rang out. Hello, she greeted Rob. Can you believe we're done with meetings and everything else in just 30 days? I didn't expect everything to go so smoothly, Rob replied with a smile. Hi, Lauren. No, I didn't expect it to be so fast either. We spent a lot of time on planning and preparation, and it turned out to be more than the time we spent on execution. I think this is the result of a successful plan, don't you think? Personally, I am relieved that everything is finally over. The stress of hiding our affair weighed on me, and I understand why long-term affairs often end disastrously. In our situation, this is not the case. Although my wife still doesn't know anything, I can predict that over time, everything will come to a natural end. You mentioned that David won't be back in town until late at night, right? I thought it would be nice to have a drink today to celebrate our success and conclude, so to speak, with an unforgettable finale. Rob, it was pretty frustrating. Although I understand your request, we must adhere to the established rules and refrain from any actions not according to the rules. Lauren and Rob undressed, and David heard the sounds of kissing coming from Lauren. The bed creaked plaintively, and David became an unwitting witness to their betrayal. David couldn't understand why Lauren was putting her marriage on the line for such a mundane cause. Secondly, what struck David even more was the absence of any humiliation or slander against their spouses. This gave him the opportunity not to doubt that the novel was real, despite the fact that they had already had five dates. Friday night turned out to be restless for David and Lauren. Sleep did not come. After a while, David finally came to terms with the fact that further listening to the recording would not do any good. Wanting to make the most of the weekend, he decided to write to Lauren. He sent a message in which he planned to come to her house at 11 o'clock in the morning. Meanwhile, after hearing the sound of an incoming message on her phone, Lauren quickly picked up the phone. After reading David's message, she responded by writing that she wanted him to come home and apologized for hurting him. However, David, lost in his thoughts, did not pay attention to Lauren's answer. 
David arrived shortly before 11 a.m., his footsteps heavy as he walked to the front door. He pressed the doorbell, and Lauren answered. David, you don't have to ring the doorbell, she said with a note of annoyance in her voice. However, David explained, it was unpleasant for me to just walk in. Feeling the tension, he suggested, maybe we can sit down at the kitchen table and talk about what will happen next. But Lauren couldn't hide her disappointment with David's cold and businesslike behavior, and she was uncomfortable with the way this conversation unfolded. As they sat at the table facing each other, there was a brief pause in the room, as if freezing time, before David broke the silence with a question that sent a shiver down Lauren's spine. Can you deny that I found out about your relationship with Rob? Tears welled up in Lauren's eyes as she pondered David's question, marveling at his unwavering determination and directness. She believed that this conversation should have been aimed at helping David understand that her actions had not changed her love for him, and that her affair with Rob was just a way to prove that her colleagues at work were wrong. David, it's important for you to understand the whole picture. Although David was aware of the chance meetings, he was unaware of the important conversations that took place between Lauren and her work colleagues and which eventually led to the creation of Rob and Lauren's plan, which was supposed to refute the opinion of their friends. Before we start looking into this case, it's important for you to know that Rob and I took up this venture only to prove that it's possible to have an affair without arousing anyone's suspicions. At the same time, a few months ago, a topic arose among my work colleagues to talk about how affairs are revealed and what destructive shocks they cause in marriage. The discussion led to a clear division into two opposing points of view. On the one hand, there were those who believed that any affair that went beyond sex for one night would inevitably be revealed, and vice versa, those who argued that in order to hide, in a lot of cases, one night stands, it is necessary to carefully think through a plan and, of course, go for deception. Rob and I joined the second side and started discussing the precautions that would be needed. Wait a minute, are you saying that all this was just an experiment or a game to see if you could have a secret affair without anyone noticing? Yes. That's right. Just discussing it turned into a kind of game. The ideas that we initially mulled over during several lunch meetings grew and developed and eventually led to the fact that we sketched out a plan in great detail. We made sure that we could successfully complete it, but there was one catch. Our success depended on keeping our achievements a complete secret. In short, we decided to put our plan to the test, knowing full well that Rob values his wife as much as I value you. Our little game, if you will, had nothing to do with our relationship. It was purely physical. We agreed on two conditions of the experiment. It had to last at least 30 days, and we had to meet at least five times. But, David, understand that our connection was purely physical. There was no love between us. We both loved our spouses very much. We made sure that everything we did together did not go beyond the limits set by us with our partners and did not violate our obligations to our spouses. David exclaimed, Once I had a faithful wife, but now it is no longer so. I understand that now you know the truth, but if you didn't know, you would believe that I would remain faithful. For me, these meetings meant nothing more than a physical connection, and throughout this month, whenever you wanted intimacy after Rob and I were together, I never refused you, Lauren said. Great, Lauren, a small setback but with no real consequences, and now I should just feel happy, David said. I understand that you are in pain, and this terrible discovery made you feel terrible. I sincerely apologize for the pain I caused you, but I hope that telling you about the details will help to dispel all your doubts about my love for you and get rid of doubts about my feelings for Rob. He's just a work colleague of mine with whom I had a physical connection, but it was devoid of any emotionality. This mistake only happened because we both made a terrible decision. Rob and I were careful and believed that our actions would remain unnoticed, never thinking that it could damage our marriage, Lauren said. Okay, then let's get right to the point. It's a pretty long story, but in the end, it boils down to the fact that you've been unfaithful to me for a whole month. You entered into an intimate relationship with another man, completely disregarding our marriage vows, and wanted to hide this relationship from me until the end of our relationship. Now, let's get to my main question. I assume that you are not refuting any of the disgusting details that I have discovered regarding your connection with Rob, said David. Lauren was slightly depressed in response to the incessant assault of her excuses. Although she acknowledged that the facts remained unchanged, she believed that the underlying reasons should matter. These meetings were purely physical, devoid of any genuine attraction between them. 
there was not the slightest desire between them. Their only goal was to demonstrate their ability to hide infidelity. An intimate relationship had no meaning for them and brought no value. David was in a state of internal conflict, vacillating between the thought that Lauren had recently made a questionable decision and the possibility that she had always held unusual views. Apparently, there really was no passion between you, David said. David, I understand that you are disappointed. There was no real passion in our relationship, it was only physical. I am truly sorry for the pain I caused you, and I am ready to make every effort to rectify the situation, said Lauren. Wait a minute, it's still complete nonsense. The idea that it was just physical contact has no meaning, and deep down, you are well aware of this fact. We talked a lot about how important it is to be faithful to each other when we made an informed decision about our relationship. The topic of fidelity has repeatedly surfaced in our conversations about marriage. For almost a year, we met exclusively with each other, and even before I proposed, we were talking about our loyalty to each other. Again, in fact, we made a clear and explicit promise to remain faithful and confirmed it in our sacred wedding vows. I can't remember a single case when we even remotely allowed the idea that a simple excuse, it was just sex, is enough for us, David said, realizing the futility of the argument. Lauren refrained from arguments. David, you're absolutely right. Of course, we had a serious conversation about loyalty, but I want to say that we share the same basic values, especially our deep love for each other. I want to assure you that my love for you has been unwavering for the past seven years and more, and I have never harbored any feelings for Rob, even for a moment. Even if playing dominoes with Rob five times in a month could affect our relationship, I would never allow it. I want to say that these intimate meetings were solely a way to prove our case, Lauren said. So why don't you play dominoes instead? Or maybe play backgammon? Couldn't you have done something else besides having sex? You explicitly stated that sex with Rob was optional and that no one would ever know about this affair. So, in order to demonstrate your ability to have an affair, you could do something else in the hotel room that would create the appearance and essence of an affair. Mission accomplished, right? Having sex wasn't the only way to prove your ability to have an affair, David said. Regardless of whether there was intimacy between you or not, there was still the need to hide your affair from your spouses, and therefore, you are completely to blame for this. Lauren tilted her head to the side, thinking about David's question, and quickly found herself sinking into deep thought. She was trying to think of some other excuse to respond to his statement. In view of the fact that no one would ever know about it, it didn't matter at all whether Rob and I had an intimate relationship or not. In order to successfully win our secret bet, we only needed to realize our romance by hiding it with the help of secret meetings and hotels. Therefore, the question arises, why did she finally decide to have sexual intercourse? I'm not sure, David. The idea of a secret had never occurred to me before. We developed a secret romance plan to see if we could pull it off. In the end, we decided to test our plan in practice, intending to bring it to an end, Lauren explained. Throughout the day, you constantly use the word just to downplay the seriousness of your actions. It's like you casually say just for a second or just a little bit, when in fact your act is very destructive. It causes harm, and it is the most harmful thing that each of us can do for our marriage. Even worse is that you don't realize the scale of your actions, which is perhaps even more disturbing than the fact that you had an intimate relationship with another man five times in a month. It's as if you think these meetings were insignificant, which is far from the truth. This issue is of great importance to me, and so far, we have not made any progress in solving it, so I decided to leave for a while, David said. After leaving, David returned to the hotel. The following Monday, he decided to cancel his work and start thinking about Lauren's arguments. He was puzzled by the fact that she valued her loyalty so little that she was ready to give it up for the sake of winning a meaningless argument with colleagues who did not understand anything about the situation. It became clear to David that for her, it was all just a game. Disappointed and fed up, he silently decided, I've had enough. He wondered if he should continue to dwell on this issue, desperately looking for an explanation for her actions. However, deep down, he knew that there was no excuse to be found. It's not just physical intimacy, it's a betrayal of her promise to be faithful to him, those sacred vows that she made, promising to keep them all her life until death do them part. 
What really struck David was that despite the seriousness of his final choice, he felt strangely calm. Moreover, he felt a sense of relief that he hadn't felt since the moment he received that damned letter. Despite her initial disappointment, Lauren did not lose hope and readily agreed to David's proposal for a new meeting the next day. Curiously sorting through a stack of papers, Lauren asked, What is it? with a note of skepticism. David replied, It looks like it's just cheating. <laughs>